Attention, please. We're going to begin this morning with, uh, before the prelude starts, we have some announcements and updates, and here to share with us is Carol Harwood. Good morning. Today is the Community Fellowship Study. It will be led by Pastor Brian in Fellowship Hall following the worship service. And today we are collecting non-perishable food items, donations, and grocery gift cards for Ellet Good Neighbors. Please bring your change next Sunday. We will be collecting for two cents for hunger, and all donations will be given to Open M. Thank you to those who have graciously made donations to help defray the cost of replacing the fire alarm system. We have received $2,275 to date. If you would like to donate toward this expense, please place your gift in the black box in the back of the church. Please be sure to mark alarm system on your contribution. We are thankful for the members of the church family who continue to help to maintain our church home. Today is the church library used book sale. It is, will be in Fellowship Hall. It begins today and will continue for two weeks. Thank you to all who donated gently used books and puzzles to be resold to benefit the church library. Presbyterian Women Coordinating Team will meet on Tuesday, May 7th at 3 p.m. in the Oak Room. Summer will be here soon. If you're interested in helping to make Vacation Bible School a success, please contact Melissa Dean. Any help would be appreciated, whether it's for one day or for the entire week of Vacation Bible School. May 23rd is the deadline for articles for the summer edition of the Leaves newsletter. That's all I have for today. Thank you. We do have a uh, sacrament of the Lord's Supper and there will be uh, instructions that will come a little later in the worship service. I did want to um, make mention, if you have uh, members of your family or those who cannot be with us when we administer the sacrament together, it is uh, a celebration of worship. It is a sacrament. So it's something that we administer and do in a context of corporate worship. However, um, individual, individual communions can be made available to those who cannot be with us. There is a way to schedule those. It really does need to be administered uh, by the officers of the church because it is an official sacrament of the church. It isn't just a matter of, well, we'll take a couple of these kits and do this on our own. That's really not the spirit of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, but we are interested in getting the sacrament to people who aren't able to be with us on worship. And we did uh, throughout the, the months leading up to Easter try to get to as many of our shut-ins as we possibly could. But if you have others that are, are in need of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, please make uh, the church office or myself aware and we will see to meeting those needs. Thank you very much. Let's use this time uh, for the prelude to prepare our hearts for worship this morning.
Thank you, Kay. That was quite lovely. Our call to worship is found in the bulletin this morning, and it is a uh, portion of Psalm 98. Let's use these words to unite our spirits in worship today. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. If you feel physically able to do so, would you stand at this time to sing hymn 476, O Worship the King. <clears throat> Thank you. Please be seated. I would like to dismiss our children to the worship enrichment uh, this morning. We're delighted to have you here. We hope that you have a wonderful time of learning. <clears throat> For those who are involved in confirmation class, I do want to add one quick thing before you go. Uh, we will go directly downstairs to the large gathering, and we will be there for a while and then go from there to the Oak Room for the reading of our statements of faith. So, and if you have signed up to be uh, one of the elder listeners to the statements of faith, we will start in the basement and then be dismissed to the Oak Room after that. So we, we will start in plenary session all together. As we transition to our time of intercessory prayer, it's always a joy to have uh, a reason to tell of God's goodness, and we would like to uh, celebrate today 
the news from our sister Joyce Skeggs that her scan came back wonderful on uh, Monday. She is in remission. There was no sign of the cancer that was being treated. So for that, we're very thankful. Amen. Amen. Also, Brian Timmerman has gotten a good report from his latest uh, blood, blood tests regarding the, uh, the dissipation of the infection in his shoulder and will hopefully be on schedule to have the joint re-replaced then coming up in early June. So for that, we're also very grateful. We have been asked to pray for a couple of other uh, folks. <clears throat> Jan Digg has asked for prayers today for her sister, Ray. And uh, she is having uh, some discomfort and pain uh, in her side and is going to be seeking medical attention. We need to lift her up before God's mercy seat. We are praying for Karen Abrams, who's having a pain in her lower back. Rich puts in parenthesis, the pain is not me. Um, thank you for the clarification, brother. That's, that's important. <laughs> she will be seeing a surgeon uh, this week to get answers. I would like prayers also of a similar vein for my brother Bill, who was supposed to get an epidural shot in his spine. He's got spinal surgery coming up in a couple of months, but they were hoping to calm that down, but they had to wait because of a tick bite uh, on his hand to make sure that he wasn't dealing with Lyme disease uh, before. So he, he should be, it seems like he's clear of that and should be able to have the shot uh, next week, but my brother spends a lot of time out in the woods, and you know he got bit by a tick, so that happens. We have a couple of ladies that we're praying for today, who are like Joyce did, who are uh, have already begun or are undertaking treatments for lymphoma. Uh, they too, we shall lift before God's mercy seat in prayer this day. And we also want to pray for Rhonda Cannon, who is having uh, difficulty with pain in her mouth, and so it's, it's tough for her to eat. So we ask God's mercy upon her as uh, she is seeking treatment uh, for what is causing the sores in her mouth. Let us do come together as a family of faith in prayer. Dear God, we do begin in an attitude of praise as we should always bring our requests before your mercy seat with thanksgiving. We do give thanks. We give thanks for your mercies, for your ongoing presence with us, for your many blessings. Very specifically, we celebrate along with Joyce and along with Brian Timmerman uh, the good news that they have received uh, as they've undergone tests this past week. And uh, we're hopeful that Things will be good moving forward, and all shall be clear. We do pray for uh, Karen and also for Bill Nutt uh, as they meet with uh, doctors and surgeons uh, to help them with the pain that each is having in their lower back. And we are hopeful that uh, steps will be able to be taken to alleviate that pain. We pray for Ray. Uh, who's been having uh, multiple health-related issues but is having uh, tremendous discomfort in her side and pray that she will be able to get in in a timely fashion to see the doctor and to be able to uh, receive the treatment that she needs. We are praying for Valerie and for Fran who are undertaking treatments for lymphoma, each of them, and pray that they too will see the success and the faithfulness of your hand with and upon them as we have celebrated others have seen your hand so faithful. And we ask your blessing upon your people who rely upon your mercies in every way, but in particular with acute and also with chronic issues, with pain and with inflammation and with illness, we pray that your hand of healing will be with us 
and that you who have made us spiritually whole will help us to move toward being whole physically as well. For we trust in you and we believe in your goodness. And we bring not only these that we've mentioned, but others that are on our minds and in our hearts this day before your mercy seat, praying as we've been instructed by Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time we will have special music, and before Allison uh, has a few words to say, I wanted to say something especially in light of Rich Abrams' proclamation. Uh, Allison has, has struggled with her singing voice, and it is my fault. Uh, I picked up the RSV virus when I was doing the, the uh, communions to our shut-ins in the care facilities, and I brought it home to this lovely lady, and it's affected her voice, but she's going to give us her best. God bless you, sweetheart. And it is my fault, so there you go. <laughs> So this song I have not played for you yet. It's called Heaven Feels Closer. And the explanation is almost as important as the actual singing of it, which is good for me today since I'm not sure you're going to hear every word I sing because my voice just wants to shut off. Anyway, um, as a child, I was blessed to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior for, since I was a little girl. And I knew that that meant one day I would get to go to heaven and, you know, most of my life, you know, certainly through my teenage years, that was just kind of like a far-off thought, not, not anywhere I wanted to get to anytime soon or anything like that. Um, probably the first time I really lost anyone that was really, really close to me was my grandfather, the one that I've sung the song about, my grandpa. And, and I really wasn't, even then I was comforted by the fact that he was in paradise with Christ and God, and that one day I would see him. So I was really, even then, was comforted by that, and also just spent the rest of my life thinking different things would happen in life, and I'd be like, oh, I want to I want to talk to my grandpa. I want to see what he would think, you know. I want to I wanna know. And, you know, I still have that. One day I get to, you know, talk with him and see what his take is on so many things that have happened. And then, um, as you all know, I've lost my parents. Um, my mom's been gone about six years in this, this October, and my dad's been gone, it'll be four years this, this October as well. And when they died, my um, thoughts about heaven really changed. Um, I'd always thought of heaven as some place that was very far away and just so far from us that it, we, we had no connection to it at all. And I haven't, since my parents died, I feel differently about that. I feel like heaven is close by us um, and that we, if we're, if we're, our, if our hearts open, we can notice things that are little signs from heaven that are, that are ways that God lets us know that those people that we love are not that far away and that we're going to see them one day. So I have to tell you that the, this has three verses. The first one is one story that I want to share. And the, the second one is another one. And then the third verse is about, in the Bible, the story of in Jacob's dream, the ladder that reached all the way up to heaven, and there were angels ascending and descending. So that's my third verse. And then the chorus, I'm only going to sing once. It's after you've heard all three verses. And it is about some of the details of what awaits us in heaven. So the first verse is happened about, is a story that happened about a year after my mom had died. Many of you know that I, um, she and I truly enjoyed horseback riding together, and we would go to Pennsylvania where the elk are, and we ride out in the wilderness, and we just loved that, loved doing that together. The, the year after my mom died, my good friend um, Pam Kerr, who's not here today, she's with her husband on a fun trip, but uh, she and I were riding, and we'd taken off. I wasn't thinking about my mom or anything. I was just happy to have a, a friend and be out there doing the thing that I loved, and I'm riding along, I'm in front of her by 20 yards or so on the trail, and she's behind me. And all of a sudden I hear, Allison, 
And I'm like, turn around, I look at Pam, and I'm like, what? And she's like, I didn't say anything. What are you talking about? And so I told her, you know, I said, you know, I heard this. And the more we talked about it, the more I realized that was my mom's voice, which is weird. It's, it's unexplainable. But it was clearly, as I remembered what it sounded like, it was her. And so that's one of my little, that was, I think, a God thing, a God gift to me that say, you know, she's not that far away. She's with me. She's not that far so other little things have happened, but the third verse um, is, is just this last summer. And it was actually my, we live in, we've moved into the property that was my family's. And my dad was a big flower gardener. And I, my goal since we've moved in has been not to kill my dad's flowers. So <laughs> it's taken me a while, but I'm slowly learning more about them. And I'm doing better. And last summer I had such fun learning all about sunflowers, which was, you know, my own new thing for myself. But one of the flowers my dad grows that I still know nothing about, and basically they have survived in spite of me, are the few roses that he has. And one of them, there's this one rose that, it's in horrible shape. It, it, it grows, it's just one plant, and it grows this tall so that it can get past the lilac bush. And usually it has just one flower, but it's those Mr. Lincoln. If you know anything about Mr. Lincoln, it is the most wonderful smelling dark red rose there is on the planet. Anyway, that usually would just get one flower. And it did, like in June, late June, it got a flower. And then um, this last year on October 6th, which is the anniversary of my mom's death, I looked out there and there was a spectacular, just starting to open bloom of this flower on the day that, you know, was the anniversary of mom's death. And I just felt like that was both, you know, my dad's flowers and the anniversary of her death. That was God's, another way for him just to reach out and say, hey, I'm, I'm still here, you know. So anyway, long explanation. And pray for me that my voice does not shut off so you can't hear the words. <laughs> Since my parents' death, heaven feels closer. Not up in the sky, but somehow closer and nearby. I have sensed their presence many times. A whisper in the woods, my name called out loud. Rose blooming red, five years to the day that my mama joined her savior in paradise. I have sensed their presence many times. Truly a gift. Dream a ladder reached from earth to heaven with angels ascending and descending with God at the top of the ladder. Jesus is our ladder to heaven. swallowed up in victory every saint will be clothed in white waving branches of genuine praise they will rest 
in the shade of his presence and all of heaven will rejoice every soul in heaven praise God unending for he is worthy of all our praise for he Thank you, Allison. It was beautiful. The voice hung in there. I feel less guilty. <laughs> our scripture lesson today, as we begin our, our heart's meditation uh, in preparation for the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, our scripture lesson today comes from Romans in the 10th chapter, uh, beginning with the verse numbered 5. <clears throat> Paul writes, Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. And again, let us pray. Blessed God, we pray that the meditations of my mouth and all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight through the faith your spirit brings. In Jesus' name, amen. In a book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 6, the scripture says, without faith, is, it is impossible to please God. And we believe that. Well, we believe that like we believe other things because the scripture declares it to be so. Fair enough. But my question for us to ponder today is why is that true? That, that it really requires faith, it really requires this relationship in order for us to be able to please God. If you live in an ordered society, and it, you, we can look anywhere around the world, any culture, any society you want, societies have laws. We began our scripture lesson today, Paul talking about this is how it goes with there's a righteousness that is in accord with law. It's about doing the right or expected things. And the laws of the land are there to guide and direct us as to what those right things are and to avoid the wrong things. But here's the rub. Every culture, every nation, every state, every city, all around us has regulatory principles, laws. Um, <clears throat> some of them are, uh, to violate them is a minor thing if you get caught driving too fast, you can get pulled over, you might get ticketed, 
He might, might cost you some money, but you know, there are other laws that are you know, class A felonies, and you can lose your freedom over those things. <clears throat> so we have these rules, these regulations in place so that people will know what's the acceptable way to go about living life and what's not. And because we have those, everybody abides by them and everything goes well. Right. Things come into collision courses. Sometimes uh, I don't have what I need or what I think I want. And so I need to step outside the regulations to get what I need or to get what I want. It could be something as simple as stealing something that doesn't belong to me. Now, I've violated the regulatory principle, the rule, the law. One of the Ten Commandments that God gave to the people, you should not steal. Because there's no peace in the community when people take what doesn't belong to them from others. It creates discord and unrest. But sometimes it's more complex than that. We're dealing with this, with this business on our, our college and university campuses right now. It's, it's crazy. And, you know, people are feeling as though they need to express their sense of injustice in the world. And I will tell you, I 100% completely agree with something President Biden said this week. He said, you know, I support the right of people to peacefully protest. They don't like what's happening. They feel as though there's a voice that institutions, even in our own country, could have. And so they're wanting to express their displeasure. I support their right to peacefully protest. But the president said, the one who's in charge uh, through the executive branch of enforcing the laws that the legislative branch puts in place is the president or the governor or the mayor, so on and so forth, the different, at the different levels of executive branches. And he said, when you, however, occupy buildings, break windows, damage things, disrupt uh, the educational process in our institutions, that's not peaceful protesting. That's called breaking the law, and I do not support their right to do this. I, I agree with the president, and he's got a very difficult uh, position that he is in. There are people saying, well, we should call out the National Guard. How did that work out for us May 4th, 1970? It, it turned out to be a, a very uh, controversial, disruptive, and there was loss of life right here in our own backyard. It's not that simple to say all we need is the law and then everything will be ordered. We know better than that. History has taught us better than that. Current events are teaching us better than that. I, I don't point these things out to be critical of anyone, to bash anyone, nor to call for stronger or lesser action or any of that. I only point these things out so that we can see very plainly that true righteousness and justification in the eyes of God, which is to say, it's another way of saying, having a right relationship with God is bigger than having rules and regulatory principles. Sometimes we have to look at a situation and have a little bit of grace and decency, some uh, love in our hearts that reaches out toward our fellow people and helps us all come to a place where we know that we're, that we're in relationship not only with God, but with one another. I had a situation that came up while I was on a, a little weekend away years ago when my, when my children were teenagers. They were canoeing at the lake where we were, and there was a swim area, and there was a rule against putting any boats or canoes or kayaks in the roped-off swim area, but there were a, it was a holiday weekend. There was lots of speed boats. It was, there were people who were uh, cruising the shoreline. There were other people who were water skiing or tubing. And um, my children and their friends 
flipped one of the canoes over, were in the water, and speedboats were zooming by them. It was an unsafe situation. I instructed them to take the canoes over into the swim area and flip them back up right side and get in them with their life jackets on where they would be safe. A gentleman who was down near the beach started screaming at my kids because they were violating the rules by being in the swim area. I was walking that direction. I heard him yelling at them, and I said, Sir, hold up. I said, I told them to do that. And he said, well, I know who you are, and you're a pastor, and you ought to know better because your whole life is all about the rules. I said, sir, that is not my gospel. My gospel is not all about the rules. My gospel is about a relationship. I have a relationship with these are my kids and their friends. Their safety is more important to me than your beach rules. I told them to come in there so they would be safe. He said, well, I would think someone in your position would know better than to tell young people to break the rules. I knew I wasn't getting anywhere with this. I wasn't going to get anywhere with this. And honestly, if we become convinced that our righteousness is a matter of something that we do, that we can perform well enough to be justified before God, then we don't need the gospel. We are telling ourselves and the world that we are above the gospel. If we believe that we have what would accurately be described as self-righteousness, because I'm always doing the right thing. And I certainly have all the right opinions. Yes, that's right. Some of you ladies have met that guy. He, he was Mr. Right. You didn't know his first name was Always. But seriously, this is the gospel for the imperfect people. And Paul said that they're the same. The Jews who were the first ones to receive the gospel, and then the Gentiles, the people who were uh, in the neighboring nations around them, and then the peoples all around the Mediterranean, and it went forward from there to other parts of the world, as we have said many times, this global gospel. But there's no difference in the people in their standing before God. It is justification by faith spelled out, the apostle said, spelled out this way, that it's near to you. Allison was telling us that heaven is near to us. She's not wrong. She's not wrong at all. The kingdom of heaven is near to us because the salvation of the Lord is present with you, within you. And it it calls to us from within. The word is near to you, Paul said. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. Faith, the faith that justifies. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. When we have people come and join the church, our our confirmation class is going to be confirmed on May 19th. I'm going to ask these young people, who is your Lord and Savior? I'm hoping they're going to tell me Jesus is their Lord and Savior. Because that's how they're justified. If you believe, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. In your belief, in your faith in Christ, you are justified, which is to say, put into a right relationship with God. That in a, in a relationship, in a friendship with God, through Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven of our inability to live out all the regulatory principles perfectly so. The easy ones, thou shalt not commit murder. Most of us are going to get through this life and not have a problem with that. But there's some tough ones out there. You know, that coveting thing that comes up from time to time. You know, very, very clearly spelled out, you shouldn't covet what your neighbor has. <clears throat> In our culture, we're almost trained to covet. 
We're almost trained to want more. We get on social media, and you know what we see? We see these people who have the audacity to post pictures of themselves living their best life. Are you serious? You're out there living your best life. Well, why am I not getting to live your best life? You see, that, that's what happens to us. It's an internal thing. And rules and regulations summed up by the phrase in, in the book of Romans, the law, the law isn't going to address that. Our relationship to God is going to address that because it is founded on the love of God and then empowered by the grace of God poured forth to us in Jesus Christ. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper that reminds us of his sacrifice. He told us to, re to remember his body that was broken for you. He told us to remember his blood which was poured out as a new covenant, a new promise in God. And you know why that happens and why that's in place? Because we need it to be. All of us, the Jew first, the first ones to receive it, then everybody else second. Everyone who received this gospel received it because we needed to receive it. And that which is far off to us, the ability to be righteous as God is righteous, through faith becomes brought near. And yes, the kingdom of heaven is nearby. But without faith, it's impossible to please God because I'm just going to speak for me. I can't be good enough. I can't be that good. I can be pretty good sometimes. Mom, no comments. I can be pretty good sometimes, but I can't be that good. Not the way God is. I can't be perfect. So thanks be to God who instead has given us this living word in a dynamic relationship that comes to you internally, near to you, through the word of God and through your faith. And in faith you are justified and brought close to the living and true God and to the Christ whom he has sent. Thanks be to God for this a living word and let us pray. Dear God, we confess that we are sinners saved by grace. But greater than that, we confess the grace by which we're saved. For we confess Jesus Christ. We need Jesus. We need his gospel. This will be the way, our means, to be justified before your presence, to be seen as your people, beloved and set apart as a precious gift unto you. Bless us, we pray. Bless us as we receive the, the grace of Christ afresh. <coughs> Bless us as we celebrate the sacrifice that Christ has made once for all people and for all time. And bless us as we remind ourselves and one another what it means to be present with one another and with you in this sacrament. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of words of instruction, if I may, before we begin with the words of institution. Uh, if you are in the balcony and you have kits up there, you are free to begin. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You are free to begin as soon as we begin to serve at the floor level. You are also welcome to come down to the floor level if you should so choose. Um, as you come down the center aisle to receive communion, you come up to the, to the pulpit um, Use this, this side aisle to exit. There are a lot of chords and instruments over here, so it's best for us to come up the center aisle and to go out the side aisle that is to the right uh, in the sanctuary. That will help anyone to keep from tripping and falling. And um, if, uh, 
there is any way that you need assistance in receiving the sacrament if you're not feeling physically able to come forward to receive the sacrament. All you need to do, let someone know, raise your hand, and the sacrament will be brought to you. Let us be reminded of what happened on that fateful night in which the Lord was betrayed into the hands of sinful people. He gathered in the place that was called the upper room and there with his disciples celebrating the Passover meal, the Lord took bread and when he had blessed it, he broke it saying, take and eat for this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, toward the end of the meal, the Lord took the cup, proclaiming this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for the sins of many. And so we are taught by the Apostle Paul that as often as we eat of the bread or drink of the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would those who are serving the sacrament please come forward at this time?
Is there anyone who has not been served? Thank you. Let us conclude our time of sacrament as we have begun it in an attitude of prayer. Blessed God, having been found in your fellowship, we pray that as we depart from here, we would do so as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Where we find those who are hurting, let us be agents of reconciliation. Where we find those in need, let us be agents of helping meet those needs. And where we find the absence of your love, let us apply that love in heaping amounts. For we are your people, the flock that you shepherd. Bless us, we pray, toward your service. In Jesus' name, amen. Our concluding hymn, if you feel physically able to do so, please stand to sing to the Lord, number 403, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. pieces we used to talk about. That's a, that's a good Sunday school hymn right there. And I hope that everybody, I, I forgot to mention we weren't singing the Korean verses, so if you started down, the, please, uh, please forgive me for not mentioning that. I uh, did want to mention again one more time, we are all going to start together in Fellowship Hall. Book sale going on down in there is going to be devotions. There's some snacks and goodies. The uh, confirmation class will begin there and then go to a different place for the reading of their statements of faith. So big day here at Oak Hill Church. 
God be with you uh, as we continue our celebration. And if you're off to do the Cinco de Mayo thing, have a great time with that as well. Let us receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance on you and give to you his peace this day and forevermore. Amen.